these words were said by Carl Sagan in 1994. And today, perhaps more than ever, these are important. Today, when we look back at life, our school days, our teachers shouldered a very, very important responsibility. We were taught to celebrate diversity. We were taught how to make friends across borders. We were taught how to mingle, how to communicate with people who are unlike us. Teachers did that taking the great trouble of transcending personal boundaries and with great empathy and understanding towards those that they were teaching. Today our discussion shall center around those teachers who are managing multicultural classrooms every day of their lives. Without any further delay, let me now invite our first speaker. It is my privilege to introduce to you Mr. Philip Barrett. Mr. Barrett retired as the deputy headmaster from the Dune School in Dehradun after 44 years of serving in education across various educational institutions. Mr. Barrett served the Dune School as housemaster, head of department, dean of student welfare, dean of activities, deputy headmaster, second master, and acting headmaster with great distinction. He also carried out a visioning exercise for the Dune School in the year 2011 through an in-depth study of a number of British public schools and various schools in the US. Mr. Barrett qualified as a leadership trainer at Wellington College, UK in the year 2000. He is an athlete, an adventurer, and a naturalist. It is our pride and privilege to have Mr. Barrett with us today. Sir, if you're there, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Subhayu, for that introduction. Am I audible? Yes, sir, loud and clear. Yeah, okay. And a very good evening to you, Achin, our esteemed panel, and our wonderful guests who have tuned in this evening. So, um, I want to start, I, in fact, I want to start with a story, but uh, Shubhayu's story was so, um, so similar. Um, a friend of mine once uh, traveled half around the world and landed in South Africa. Um, and he was struck by the fact that he could travel halfway around the world in a jet, jet liner. It took him about 15 hours. But the moment he landed and he was being driven to his hotel, he witnessed a street fight. Uh, people were going for each other, almost trying to kill each other. And he wondered how we bridged the gap between distances, you know, with our scientific, uh, you know, mode of travel. But yet, we have not bridged the gap between neighbor and neighbor across the hedge. And uh, for me, the opposite of multicultural is narrow-mindedness, nepotism, sectarian, parochial, insular, exclusive, and elitist. And I'm reminded of Tagore's famous poem, where he talks about the mind being without fear and where the head is held high. In the end, he talks about the world having been broken into narrow, by narrow walls, fragmented by narrow walls. And I have to sadly admit, there exist schools all over the world today which embody just these qualities. It is here that children are brainwashed and taken back centuries. In a world which has become so unified and small, thanks to faster travel, globalization, international understanding, and foreign and international education being available to so many because of the ease of educational loans and porous international borders. Today, we can be born in a small village in India and study in the local school, but college should be in the nearest big city with university in the USA, a postgrad degree in Holland, followed by a job in Australia, a second job in Canada, and finally, we can even move to the Middle East the world has become small. A multicultural class prepares a global citizen to work in the world of tomorrow. And so the multicultural classroom is an all-embracing and inclusive classroom, rather than shutting ourselves, um, it involves and includes others. For me, the Taj Mahal or the Great Wall of China or the Colosseum or the Pantheon don't belong to India, China, Italy, and Greece. They belong to all the peoples of the world. Similarly, for great art, great literature, and great music, it doesn't belong to anyone. It's universal. If one looks at places, lots of places, and turmoil today, 
we are riddled with racism and discrimination from the Boko Haram atrocities to the Syrian tragedy and closer home to the narrow sectarian religious problems, the anti and anti northeast people, we discriminate against dark skinned people, women, the LGBT community. And where is this all coming from? Children are not born to discriminate and hate. They are taught. And it is our school's job to rectify this huge problem. What is fundamentalism? It's just that somebody says, my way is better than yours. Follow my way. The rise of the right thing and the exclusion of people and races is fundamentalism. Inequality, which is showing up in the suffering of the poor during this pandemic times, more than any other time. You know, we have the, you know, we, we, we reserve the right, the tide. We have, to, we have to tide over the problems and finally religious dis discrimination. The specter of war all over. War will fight over territory, water resources, uh, we'll fight over everything. And this stems from our fear, uh, the fear that harps on differences and not commonalities. But again, war is a reflection of where we stress the differences, not our shared inheritance. Look at gender insensitivity. You know, the Americans today are scared that in another 10 years, the, the white race will not be in a majority. Well, my only advice to them would be to, to look at the fact that 60% of the abortions in America are white children, are white fetuses. You know, we are, we are doing away with the girl child, we have skewed sex ratios, there's crimes towards women, there's human trafficking, there's, sex, there's sexual exploitation. What does all this mean? It's just the rights of women and sexual preferences <clears throat> are, are, are being violated, you know, from the recent US racial issue, where to me it seems that the Ku Klux Klan is working in the guise of policemen and hatred and anger after over 150 years of freedom to the border clashes with China, you know, to the problems in Yemen. What is all this? And the solution to all this is an acceptance and an understanding where, where we come from. What can schools do? The aim of education, in my view, is to bring about a sense of understanding and respect for all the peoples of the earth and to look at the world as one family, to cultivate a love for and an understanding of the diversity and the rich cultural heritage that we have. Sometimes global brands lead to this fraternal understanding. Some time ago it was said that no two nations that had McDonald's restaurants had ever been to war. And that the big M had actually helped children understand this global family. Actually, this was proved wrong to me because I think Serbia and Kosovo did go to war. And I think both of them had McDonald's um, uh, stores. Now, one way in sc the schools can be a great help in bringing about an understanding in the brotherhood would be to have a rich and varied curriculum uh, embedded in the, in the whole school program. And in my view, there is no such thing as extracurricular. I think everything is curricular. Dance and art is as important as physics and language. The positive effects of the multicultural education involve an embracing of fear, reduction of ignorance, and an understanding of minority groups which can help remove the root of stereotyping, prejudice, racism, discrimination, and anything that we fear, we need to understand. As I said again before, children are not born afraid and biased or racist or bigots or cultural Philistines. They pick up this from the teachers, parents, and mentors. We in our schools teach them how to hate and how to behave differently. It's what they hear us say is what they, what they see in our body language. And what can we do? Through subjects like history, geography, and anthropology, they have to learn the respect. You know, we, we, Islam is a very, very little known uh, religion, and we don't understand it. Uh, through our foods and customs, you know, history and anthropology teach us that we come from the same stock, from that little spot in the East African highlands, we were one family, one group of people who moved out. And so whether you're Negroid or Mongol or Caucasian, we actually came from the same stock. 
And history is full of stories of man's successes and failures. And, uh, and we can learn so much about how some societies thrive while others suffer. Uh, the folklore and the oral histories uh, from the view uh, of the subaltern study. It's important to understand that history is always seen from the point of view who, who wrote it. Um, foreign languages is very important because when you learn a foreign language, you actually delve deeper into the understanding of a culture, of a people. Uh, I know in, uh, in the class once uh, in Bombay, where I taught a lesson on Japan, and the kids uh, actually dressed up in <laughs> traditional Japanese dress, and uh, they had posters depicting Japanese sceneries. The girls came in with umbrellas. We saw a film. We even cooked Japanese food against the backdrop of music. And you could do it for any country. You could do it for Arabia, or you could do it for South Africa. Um, aesthetics and arts. So good schools have to have a thriving, bustling art, music, drama in the program, um, and, and which, which encourages diversity. And music, all sorts of music, from West African to reggae, you know, all sorts of music, uh, fusion music, it unites because music speaks this universal language. Drama again, you know, um, important to understand uh, <clears throat> um, how drama can bring people together. I remember one of my headmasters at Doon, um, we had put up this Hindi play. And in this play, there was a boy who had to um, dance. And, you know, he was supposed to, he was playing the part of a eunuch in the play. And I know that being a boy's school, there were a lot of sniggers and a lot of jeering. And the poor chap had to <coughs> really, he had a tough time. But following that, <coughs> the headmaster introduced dance to school. Dance became a very big part of our program. And even today, we have an inter-house dance competition. So while dance was laughed at, uh, on, on the stage one day, it became an art form for the boys uh, three months later. So this is how you lead about an understanding <clears throat> of people. Stories, folklore and tales from all over the world. It's all universal. There has to be a mixing of genres. <clears throat> uh, you know, books like uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, Cry Thy Beloved Country, Things Fall Apart, Remains of the Day, or movies like Schindler's List or Mississippi Burning, The Kite Runner, um, so 100 years of solitude, these all reinforce in our students an openness to other cultures to see how other people live. Movies, you know, I think a lot of good Bollywood stuff over the years, like that is a mean but to start to state a few, three idiots, you know, where they talk about mixed marriages, uh, class divide. This is all something that our children need to be exposed to. Again, sport is a great unifier. Um, we are sometimes united by the football teams we, um, we, we support, the clubs that are supporting. Um, look at the Olympic movement, look at test cricket. Uh, I think people who play test cricket are closer together um, than, than people who don't play cricket, let's say. Um, there's so much r racism in sport and, and they speak out against it. Um, um, <clears throat> In, in, in the school I worked in last, we had a pan-India clientele and uh, we had kids from all over the country. And we were a, a sort of a melting pot of cultures. And, you know, uh, Once you have people from all over the country, uh, there's less making fun of people from a certain part. And uh, <clears throat> you know, we hear different accents, we see different skin colors, we accept each other. Um, the other thing that schools can do is to introduce and encourage internationalism. You know, the receiving of foreign guests, cultural trips, the model United Nations is a very good movement. Some are community camps uh, where you work with uh, children of different ethnic groups, different social economic backgrounds, especially um, the Northeast children who are, who are so uh, uh, misunderstood. Um, uh, the, the Duke of Edinburgh scheme, now called the International Award for Young People, had, as a, one of the components it had was um, a, a residential three night, four day out where students had to spend this time in a milieu that was unfamiliar. So let's say a metro kid from Delhi and Bombay had to live in a village. And that's where you understand the grassroots grass India. Inclusive education. I think uh, schools are now very open to this to understand 
how differently able children, you know, children with some sort of um, uh, physical uh, issues, you know, I'd love to have a school where there's a blind kid or a, or a boy who's got, you know, got a hearing impairment. It just sensitizes our children. Uh, secular, the secular part of school is very important, where we celebrate and, and, and respect religious festivals from all over the world. Uh, teachers can speak and, 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 uh, and children learn uh, the, the value of uh, inclusion. Uh, in the school I worked in, we had, we celebrated Labor Day, we celebrated a community lunch on uh, the 2nd of October, where we honored and respected the service of our support staff. Um, digital education can play a very big role in bringing about the multicultural classroom. Because uh, while we can't go out to every part of the world, the world can come into our classrooms. And digital education can help us understand starvation, war, injustice, we can bring every part of the world into our classes. Uh, I remember once a group of boys were wasting food. They were turning their nose up to uh, the fair serve at lunch. So I went to class, the next class, and I projected a number of very sad, very pathetic images of starving children in Somalia. And there was spin drop silence. I'm sure there was even a little shedding of tears. But uh, I never got any complaints about food after that. Um, also, I think it's important to integrate various disciplines through the teaching of a subject. Uh, you need to inculcate international understanding through geography, English, history, um, and where, where children see that all these are together, you, you bring in history and maths, you can bring in physics and geography, and so on. Um, questions that teachers have to ask is, am I role modeling the new global citizens? Um, or am I letting my biases infiltrate my comments and my reactions? Um, am I leaning toward one side politically? Do the kids notice this? Um, the children pick up everything. So do I treat all students, no matter what their race or color, their beliefs, their social status, do I treat them with respect? Am I fair in my dealings with them? So a teacher's role modeling is also of paramount importance. And with that, I will hand it back to you, Shubayu. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. As I was just now saying that you teachers have taught us how to celebrate diversity. And listening to you, it took me back to my school days as to how our teachers would instill this sensibility in us. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is now time to move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Ochin Bhattacharya. Ochin is the founder and CEO of Notebook. A chartered accountant by training, he was a director at Deloitte prior to starting Notebook. He has worked in India and abroad in various senior capacities in GE, PwC, KPMG, and Deloitte. Ochin is an avid reader and a passionate traveler with a keen interest in economics, history, literature, and philosophy. He's a regular speaker at various forums and chambers of commerce and also contributes articles to numerous publications regularly. He's also on the board of some of the most renowned corporates and contributes significantly to brand strategies. Ochin, over to you. Shubhavi, am I audible? Loud and clear. Good evening, everyone. I extend a warm welcome to all of you who are here with us today to discuss this wonderful topic, which is very relevant in today's cosmopolitan world. Now, economic necessities and quest for growth have facilitated migration of human race in search of opportunities. And thus, a lot of major habitats around the world have become melting pot of global culture. Now, very often, this leads to dual identity and a search for home, which has been depicted very beautifully in various works of literature. Now, one such masterpiece, which instantly comes to my mind, where these moments have been captured very beautifully, is Tea with Milk by Alan Say, where little May suffers from the feeling of not being at home when her parents return back to Japan after calling San Francisco their home for years. Before I go ahead with my deliberation, I'd like to specially thank 
and welcome our esteemed panelists who have joined us from around the world to enrich us with their thought process. Now, culture is a broad term and one that is not easily summed up. In her book, Culture Learnings, The Fifth Dimension on the Language Classroom, author Lewis Damon very aptly defined culture on the lines of learned and shared human patterns or models for living and aspects for human and social interaction. According to her, culture is a mankind's primary adaptive mechanism. Thus, students from various nationalities, ethnicities, and races all bring cultural traditions to their interactions in the classroom. And it's up to teachers to recognize, celebrate, and share these different perspectives. In a globalized world, cultures from various sources merge to form a homogeneous way of life. And this process of intermingling takes time and generations for a common way of life to emerge in terms of choice of food, be it music, arts, and other lifestyle preferences. Although children are more flexible than adults and are quicker in adapting to new way of life at home, they're exposed to the culture that their parents follow, which may be significantly different from, from, from what his friend sitting next to him witness at home and also bring to the class. Also, first generation immigrants all over the world are very particular about being able to retain their culture, and rightfully so. Most of the times, even much more than their friends back home. I can remember a very beautiful but controversial novel, epistolary novel, which captures this phenomena by Alice Walker called The Color Purple. This Pulitzer Prize winning novel tells the struggle of an African-American woman in rural Georgia in the late 1930s. Schools, I believe, are the greatest leveler. Inside the classroom, there needs to be a degree of homogeneity in everything, starting from what children are wearing, to what books they're studying, to the amount of individual attention that a child is getting from the educator. A classroom attuned to individual histories and backgrounds of students is best positioned to be an inviting and stimulating space for all students. Now, our students need to be educated on the beauty of difference. Schools are absolutely important for a students growing up because it is a miniature version of the society that exists outside its walls. And hence, it teaches democratic way of life. Now today, very often, while growing up in nuclear families, the only place where a child learns to share or to be treated at par with everyone else is the school. Now coming to multicultural education, I believe it is a concept built on the ideals of freedom, justice, equality, and human dignity, which is also mentioned in the Declaration of Human Rights and is adopted by UNO. It refers to any form of education that incorporates the histories, texts, traditions, and beliefs and values of people from various cultural backgrounds. The education system values the cultural differences and reflects them through the students, teachers, and various communities. It challenges all forms of discrimination in schools and societies to the promotion of democratic principles of equality and social justice. Now, a multicultural classroom is one in which there's a blend of students from various cultures to form a diverse learning environment where culture not only includes tradition and religion, but also races, language, socioeconomic level, ethnicity, and living conditions. To combine all this in a classroom involves a lot of creativity and management skills on the part of teachers. For teachers with a classroom full of students from different backgrounds, the responsibility to connect with them goes beyond simply knowing where they are from or what their favorite subjects are. These teachers must strive to understand their students in a more holistic way, incorporating their cultural traditions into lessons and activities so that a student feels understood, comfortable, and can focus more on learning. Now coming to the Indian context, now, India is a 
India is culturally, linguistically, religiously, and ethnically one of the most diverse countries in the world. The multicultural experience is represented in what is called unity's diversity. This includes the diversity of religious communities, languages, ethnicities, and traditions and cultures so of various states. I remember Mr. Mr. Bhikkhu Parekh, a Labour Party member of the House of Lords and a former professor of political theory and philosophy. He once said while describing India's diversity that India has a common criminal law, but not a civil law. Now to focus on the concept of multiculturalism is a matter of exigency for the harmonious and progressive future of India as it is for global classrooms worldwide. Now, majority of classrooms in India contain students who belong to different cultures, follow different beliefs, customs and traditions, belong to different socio-economic status, and adhere to different sets of ideology. Now, one of the challenges, now coming to, coming to some unique advantages that children studying in multicultural classrooms enjoy and how, how a teacher can play a role in it. One of the challenges of communication is interacting with people from different backgrounds. And we all know how important it is for success in the modern day global village. Now, thankfully, in a multicultural classroom, the teacher can promote daily student interactions. This will tremendously help children to become better communicators, which they could find essential later in their lives. With a diverse population present in a single classroom, each student can share their own culture with their fellow classmates. The experience allows children to be open-minded and to get a deeper understanding and appreciation of each other's culture. In essence, it can truly benefit and help students maintain a healthy relationship with each other. I, I remember reading a very nice book co-authored by Her Highness Queen Ryan of Jordan called the Sandwich Swap, where best friends Salma and Lily eat sandwiches at school every day. But Salma eats hummus and Lily eats peanut butter. Together, they work to overcome the differences among themselves. Now, one of the world's biggest social issues is stereotyping which leads to unwanted judgmental attitude towards our fellow citizens. A multicultural classroom gives students and teachers the opportunity to show their empathy to each other, no matter what their backgrounds are. As children from different races come together in one classroom, teachers can use this opportunity to build a positive classroom culture. Now, this interpersonal relationship in the class will be based on trust, respect, and empathy. Now, one of the best things about being in a multicultural classroom is being able to celebrate different cultural events from countries around the world. And this is where only the teacher can play a role. Only he can promote this. For instance, holding a food festival may help students understand the origin and cultural significance of various dishes. Aside from food, students may also celebrate music, dance, storytelling, quiz, based on different culture. So with that, I would like to thank all of you for giving me a patient hearing and look forward to the deliberations by a distinguished panelist today. Over to you, Shubhai. Thank you so much, Achin. Thank you for sharing those wonderful views about multiculturalism and how it impacts our education system. Now, in truly keeping with the theme of multiculturalism, we wanted to have speakers from around the globe. We are very fortunate that some people from different countries agreed to be part of the Together for Education webinar. It is now my privilege to introduce to you Mr. Dharminder Manan. Mr. Manan is the founder principal of the Dunes International School, Al Khobar, Saudi Arabia. He holds an MSc degree in physics with a B. Ed and has over 30 years of experience in the field of education, including 14 years of administrative experience of CBSE schools in India and abroad. 
He has been a senior secondary teacher for 16 years with a rich experience of learning, running IG CSE curriculum schools as the principal, dealing with students on multiple nationalities. Truly running a school in Saudi Arabia, Mr. Manon perhaps handles a large segment of the South Asian diaspora as well as students from various other cultures and countries. Mr. Bannon himself has extensively traveled across the GCC countries and the US. It is our privilege to have Sir with us today. Sir, over to you. Uh, good evening to one and all. And uh, I believe the previous two speakers here, Mr. Achin and uh, our headmaster from uh, Dunes, he has already spoken a lot about the multicultural classroom and its management. Uh, I would like to just have some uh, real-time experience of handling the students from different country. Let me share with you, I'm here in this uh, country, Saudi Arabia, for the last 10 years. And uh, in this course of time, uh, I experienced myself being as a teacher in the class where IGCSE curriculum students from different country, like uh, Egypt, Syria, even Sudani, Somalis, these, these all, uh, you know, the things that we are talking in our previous conversation is about, you know, the culture, the religion, the, uh, the you know, the color even there. So these all are the things which a teacher generally faces there in the class and until unless uh, harmony is not being maintained there in the class, uh, in various ways, the things cannot be managed in the class there. So uh, truly speaking that uh, while teaching physics to these all the students, you can't expect that, okay, the student who is of uh, somewhere from the Indian context over there is going to uh, give you a very good respect saying you all time, sir, whereas the student who is from a background of uh, Egypt or Assyria, he will say, is your teacher. How can you just say this? Can you explain me this? So I'm talking something in a, in a real classroom, what happens because of the cultural differences and here the teacher had to accept such a uh, narration and such sort of behavior of the children there with the different you know cultural background no doubt that uh, once you just reach to these students in a, a very empathetical way in a nice way that you can reach to their heart and as i said earlier that until unless you don't connect with them you won't be able to bring that multicultural classroom there and for that the various things as uh, um, uh, our previous speaker, they had said that we conduct the intra-house competition, we conduct the annual day, and we give them the equal opportunity to be a part of such activities. Even the student council that we have four houses and then in the student council, we make sure that uh, the students from different nationality are there being incorporated. And that way we get gel well with each other, but many a times it happens over there the racism is there. The students of those particular country, they form a group and they, you know, that happens in particularly in the senior classes like seventh, eighth, and even in sometimes ninth and tenth also, that they form a group and they find that we, we are secluded and uh, we are being treated differently by different teacher over there. So on that note, it, it's, it's a big challenge which uh, we all are sharing over here that once you are having a multicultural classroom, obviously different activities to be performed so that the teacher make a, a somewhere a classroom teaching learning environment a conducive one there. And obviously the different activities which is to be performed, uh, learning about somebody who, how he celebrate the uh, birthday, maybe that I'm cutting the cake and somebody uh, in, in his country is going to just have the celebration of his birthday in a different way, bringing different sort of uh, dishes. We, we have a food festival like, uh, uh, and the carnival even there. In the carnival, we just uh, ask the student to just dress up in the uh, dress of their particular country and to bring the dishes there. So that way, once we have got a multicultural proceeding, then the students, they start respecting each other and they love each other. It, it, it's a big, big challenge for the teachers teaching the different languages even. Many a times, particularly if those who are aware of uh, Saudi Arabia, here uh, Egyptian and even the uh, Middle East people, the Saudi Arabia particularly, they can't speak the word pa. They will not say papsi, they will say bapsi. 
So now, now to understand that what the particular child is speaking or what the teacher is speaking and that, that the linguistic problems which are coming over there is again a big, big, big challenge there. To have a multicultural classroom is always an asset to the school in the sense that they see that once these children, they are going to carve their career in the forthcoming time. They may be going to different other countries with a different culture. Over a period of time and their schooling, they learn that yes, how to have friends quickly. And this once they carry out in their uh, higher studies there, they find that, okay, all right, we are having the different uh, classmates of a, a different countries over there or a different cultural background and they get gel well very fast there. No doubt that when you are a teacher, you need to have a balance here. With the present set of scenario, what personally I, I, I would like to just speak a little bit about the post-COVID situation, what will be the scenario tomorrow? Today, uh, running a, a CBSE and an IGCSE school, already the IGCSE results are being declared on the basis of the performance of the term one. Similarly, CBSE also is not going to conduct any examination in the foreign countries. Obviously, uh, the school performance of the student will be gauged and the results will be prepared by the CBSE and it will be given there. Now, the, the point is that as of now, every school is running the virtual classes there. Then how tomorrow the, the student is going to just get the education. I may be just, I, I want to have the uh, English being learned by somebody who is a native speaker. So I may be having an English teacher from UK. He is getting connected with me on uh, Zoom and I'm getting my class there. I may be having uh, the science or a maths teacher of my taste and of my inception over there. So under that circumstances, I believe that the total scenario of education in the post COVID session, and if this pandemic remains the same is going to change drastically. And I said that earlier, that the teacher has to become a global teacher. He has to understand that, okay, what is the, the fair accent that he has to carry on so that he can be tired by a number of students sitting abroad in any country over there to learn from him. No doubt the school's uh, role will remain over there. The emotional touch that we are having as of now with the students while being in the live class is missing in this situation out there. So, um, uh, dear friends and the listener over there, I can just simply say that uh, um, um, we may be having so much of things all around us, trying our level best to bring a very, uh, a very uh, democratic uh, classrooms over there, but many times it happens over there. I'm sharing with you one of my experience of last year, we took around about 26 students to NASA for a, a trip in uh, this Tampa. And two of our Somalian students, they also registered themselves. I'm sorry to quote that their visa was not processed. We are talking about today the, you know, somewhere uh, multicultural classroom. We are talking about giving equal rights to every person. The child who is studying in grade seven, at par his friends are going to US for a trip there and he's equally paying over there, but his visa is not processed because I believe the people, those who know this fact, that in US Somalians, their visa is not being processed. We need to see many things very holistically that how we can bring this change there. Why, why, why? Still, uh, I'm unable to answer and I'm unable to repay back the money that they deposited. And you know, the travelers, even they said that we have booked uh, so many things in, uh, in US over there for these children and that money can't be returned. So there, you know, here we, we on the education forefront in the classes, we are, we, we are trying our level best, but on the contrary, what the country norms are there, what other, other countries they have got the restrictions on the basis of the country or the basis of the culture or on, the, on many other bases over there. I believe everyone uh, has seen this uh, uh, movie, uh, My Name is Khan and I'm not a terrorist over there. So anyone who is coming with the, with the surname of terrorist over there, so even still, if you land there in uh, Germany or if you land somewhere in US, you will find that anyone who is with such uh, uh, surnames, which is uh, suspicious over there, he's being scrutinized like anything. Uh, I'm sharing with you, this had happened with me when uh, I, I landed there in Germany. 
and uh, uh, my one of my student he was uh, put aside over there because his name was matching as per the computer system with some something suspicious over there so i said that okay all right once he will be scanned i also will be scanned i i, I accompanied him i told him don't worry nothing will happen we will pass on very quickly so what my submission in today's discussion is that no doubt with so many activities like you know the food culture the carnivals while having a multicultural classroom we are trying our level best to give the best education to the student to let them be globally compatible simultaneously training the teachers also on those line that yes you you need to just work out with the help of so much of teaching aids with you that you can reach to each individual so i believe that these live experiences that i am having uh with the over a period of uh, last 10 years with the different nationality students has uh, given me a different insight to look into it i'm telling you the chinese students they are very very good in mathematics they they do excel i i, I am sure that the girl who had appeared this year from a cbc examination in grade 10 she is going to score 100 out of 100 the, they there are many many other students those who are wonderful other than the indian nationality or the but uh, many a times we face that such uh, big discriminations are there the student once this chinese student is going to join in grade 11 i don't know what sort of uh, things she is going to face because of uh, uh, this pandemic which has originated from in china so uh, there are so many things as a, a daily challenges which comes to us there and i believe we as a teacher and uh, my team uh, the of teachers over there and i as a principal tries our level best to handle such situations and and is is a challenge over there is is a big big challenge there uh, i i believe that much of the things are already being spoken by the two uh, previous speaker and uh, of course uh, for the teachers it, it's a big challenge managing a multicultural classroom students they learn a lot in the multicultural classroom and they become a global citizen and i believe that to be a successful person you need to be globally compatible whether it is a teacher or whether it is a student uh, i'm done sachin and uh, it's over to you thank you very much for uh, inviting me to be a speaker over here uh, i believe i could be able to share the live uh, things which i have experienced during my uh last uh, seven to eight years with the international students over here thank you very much thank you so much sir this was absolutely fantastic we have been talking about multiculturalism from our perspectives but your role as an administrator and as a teacher with so many nationalities inside your classroom dealing with international travel policies is quite mind boggling to be honest it's been an absolute privilege listening to you sir thank you so much with that we now move on to our next speaker our next speaker is ms monisha datta datta ma'am is the co-founder and director of the doon girls school and the dehradun boys school in dehradun she holds a postgraduate degree in computer science with an mba in advertising she started as a software developer and then moved on to training where she discovered her passion for education and now she has over two decades in the field of education at her schools she remains actively involved in teaching curriculum design and training the trainers personally she is an avid reader a nature enthusiast a vocalist a painter and an equestrian it's our privilege to have ms monisha datta here with us today ma'am if i may invite you good evening one and all uh it's been quite an enlightening evening listening listening to barit sir and mr anchin achin and mr menon now uh i just would like to start my uh, thing with just a thought why did india in such dire times where we were talking about social distancing and not stepping out we had a uh, extreme lockdown happening why did india at such a dire time see such a huge amount of laborers on the road when we were talking about uh, the lockdown when the government was declaring the lockdown did we not think about them did this part of our community not exist for us in our minds what exactly uh, do we think of when we think of indians 
these are the questions that have been bothering me since the time the lockdown happened. COVID-19, yes, has been uh, an eye-opener in a lot of ways, but the most important way this was an eye-opener was that we are not inclusive as a society. We're talking about multiculturalism and all these things, but how come we missed out on such a huge number of people? Like if I look at the roads, if we were looking at the roads, if people were watching the news that time, we would have realized that it is not a handful of people that we missed out on. We missed out on actual India. How did that happen? Uh, and what do you think would have happened uh, if we would have thought differently? So if we look at our schools, our schools are nothing but a miniature model of our society. Uh, why do we send children to school? COVID-19 has shown us very well that education can be imparted anywhere and we're still not missing the human touch per se, right? But at the same point of time, okay, we're not into that much of a human uh, touch, but we are still there. So education can be gained for a person who wants to be educated will ensure that they get education wherever they are. Then what is it that schools teach us? Schools basically, you send children to schools because you want them to learn social skills, social behavior. And that is why a school is a miniature model of our society. So did we somewhere miss out on teaching children how to observe and take care of everyone else around them? Uh, when we talk of biodiversity or when we talk of diversity, we, we biodiversity wise also we are very weak. Whether it is nature, whether it is our own, own human species, I think there is too much of segregation. There is too much of compartmentalization that is happening. So as schools, we have to teach children how to adjust in the society and to be a positive contributor in it. If we rightfully say schools um, contribute to the social and the spiritual development of the school, of, of a child, so if we look at a, the India's, if we look at India's population, we are, I think, the second largest. And this gives us a huge opportunity to observe the diversity that we have. We have the maximum number of religions. We have the maximum number of cultures, castes, ethnicities, languages, cuisines. And I'm using the word opportunity because to learn multi-diversity, multicultural, we don't need to really move out of our own country. We can learn a lot from our own, within our own country. But at the same point of time, because of globalization, we have the availability of people from across the globe. People are traveling, whether it is for business, whether it is for education. In residential schools, you'll find a huge amount of, uh, a substantial number of children coming from different parts of the world. So, People are moving around. So how do we ensure that we are teaching children multicultural approach towards each other? You know, the tragedy of our schools is that we teach whatever is in the curriculum. If it is not in the curriculum, it is kind of sidelined. So thus to be able to manage a multicultural environment, I think the first thing that we need to do is introduce it into a curriculum. Our curriculum should be designed in such a way that there is a subject known as a multicultural study or you know understanding uh, uh, the importance of tolerance importance of respect learning empathy so everything included in the multicultural studies and if we are talking about schools to include this as a curriculum this needs to be added on in the curriculum of the uh, teacher training program also we should have teachers specially trained to be able to teach cultural diversity to the students of all age groups. And no child is young enough to not know about racism or not know about discrimination. They face it every day of the school life, some of them. So I had very rightfully said, children learn, Mr. Barrett, when he, was, he started with this thing, he said the children are not biased, we teach them, the adults teach them all the biases. Why is it when we are looking out for the princess role, it's always the fair person, the pretty looking one who gets the role. And anything which has to do with um, not nice or wicked is given to a person who's dark complexion or a little fat. Why do we look at the physical attributes when we are giving roles to the children in place? Are we not indirectly telling that child that, oh, if only you were fair, you would have got that role. 
So we have to be watchful. As teachers, we need to develop our skills to be able to understand multicultural diversity. If we look at our country, I uh, think multiculturalism is a new concept for India. Till up till the medieval times, we were a very conservative and a close society. Most of our gurukuls were based on the concept of caste. So, you know, we never really needed to understand the different cultures. And when we look at our, our classrooms of today, we can find children from every possible religion, every possible caste, every belief, even different class. So we cannot afford not to be aware of it. And at the same point of time, our children are getting exposed to every possible piece of news that is available in the world. Whether it is to do with religion, whether it is to do with uh, casteism, anything. They have questions. They are all growing minds which have got a lot of queries in it. How do we address them? How do we answer? How do we make them sensitive to the understanding of each other's religion and culture? So as teachers, if we are not able to sensitize our children, we are failing as teachers. We are failing as an institute. And most of all, we are failing as humans. See, most of us have grown up in the era when we've had grandparents who have been a part of uh, partition. They've had their memories. They've had their reasons why they carry animosity for a certain religion, which is both ways. It's understandable. But are we seeing those times? Then why are we ensuring that we are creating another time like that? Should we not ensure that our children are not replicating the mistakes of history? Like, uh, I think Mr. Barrett only quoted about it. Why are we not looking at history? Why are we not teaching children history, keeping in mind to understand the mistakes that we have made, to make them understand the various um, societal norms that each society follows, the various culture, cultures, understand those cultures, understand the diversity, understand how their thoughts work and why their thoughts work in that way. We humans are actually a repository of humanity. And you know where we go wrong? We go wrong because we create an image, not of the person. We create an image of the person based on our own prejudices against the religion or the caste or our beliefs or against our lived realities. And without even thinking, once we've created that image, anybody who fits into, who is a part or a subset of that particular group we see the person like that. I'll tell you something from exam, uh, from a real thing. One of our students, uh, we have Jain, Jain kids in the school, right? One of the students went up and asked the Jain kid, uh, how come you're not wearing a mask? That means you're not a pure Jain. Another student, uh, a class one child was found crying. And when asked what went wrong, the child had to say that all of them are telling me to go back to Pakistan. But ma'am, I don't live in Pakistan. I live in India. Class one, five-year-olds. Where are they getting all these messages from? And why are they being insensitive? That is what, as a school, we need to become very aware and ensure we are teaching in the school while the child is at school, rather than passing on our prejudices and our lived realities to them. They are allowed to make their own future. And for that, they will need to think. They will need to think on their own. They will need to be taught. Uh, we at school can only create this kind of an environment when we are teaching the kids, keeping certain things in mind. We have to develop an equity pedagogy. I'm not using the word equality, I'm saying equity. We need to understand the limitations and the uh, norms of each and every culture. See, when we're talking of our class, our class has got people from different kinds of backgrounds, religions, right? So we can pick up at least those number of religions, castes, and beliefs and ethnicities or whatever, and then just discuss those can we exchange information regarding those between the children? Can we ask the children to um, do their own research based on each other's religion and each other's beliefs? Why do you think that person thinks like that? 
what are the advantages of that thought not every thought that comes each religion has a reason behind the philosophy that they work on so what are those philosophies can we encourage children to do their own research can we make them critical thinkers can we teach children through holding group discussions so they have to understand the difference between discussion and argument most of the time what happens we don't discuss we argue and when we are arguing our point is the right point when we are discussing we are have the ability to listen and that is the ability that we need to develop in a child understanding when to stop and when to put your point across not always keep saying what you have to say but listen to what people have to say there is a reason behind why they believe in a certain thing so holding uh, group discussions keeping integrated content in the class means material which is uh, having information regarding all the religions and the various diversities that you have in this class we talking about a class but slowly and steadily when you are doing this as an activity you realize or when this is a part of your curriculum you realize that this becomes a philosophy of your school so when a child of a different uh, background walks into your class a different religion walks into your class there is an anxiety there's not an anxiety there is an enthusiasm among the classmates they want to know about that person they want to find out more about it they will welcome the person and maybe dressing up the way the child is so it has to become an integral part of our system and the biggest challenge comes when we are talking about religion belief religious beliefs uh especially the wrongs done by one community onto the other you will always notice that a lot of these kind of activities uh, adaptability and all these things are done in the residential schools because they consciously making an effort in trying to look at various ways and means to incorporate all of this we have a lot of uh, festivals that are conducted whether it's world music or whether it is uh, cuisines whether it is the uh, the dresses that they wear a lot of things but even then knowingly or unknowingly we miss out on two subtle areas the diversity on culture uh, uh, sorry uh, the diversity on caste and class either we not comfortable to address it as yet or we still struggling with the idea that this doesn't exist at least not in our space so we all need to just come out in the open and have discussions as teachers we need to change our mindsets read more understand each other's culture more and we have to remember one thing children of today whatever we are giving out to them they are going to give back to the society tomorrow we cannot say that they are not sensitive enough we did not contribute in making them sensitive they are not empathetic enough they are self centered all that happens when we as teachers fail to instill those things into the children and nothing is possible without building relationships we have to be culturally sensitive but more than culture sensitive we have to be human sensitive we have to learn to build bonds with our students and whatever we do they just follow so if we are empathetic if we are unbiased if we are non partial i'm sure the culture will be built on its own thank you so much thank you so much ma'am for sharing those wonderful thoughts with us as you said rightly the students need to be taught to think independently develop their own perceptions and thoughts which is something of a rarity in this world given the echo chambers that social media often builds around us right taking a cue from there what i will do is quickly show you our product notebook and i will try and tell you why what ma'am said was so pertinent to all of us give me one second the screen share seems to be stuck
Yes. Uh, as all of you know, Notebook is an education technology platform. We are India's first after school learning app. And we try to build content that can be used both within the classroom as well as by students at home so that revisions can happen seamlessly. During this coronavirus lockdown, we wanted to help the schools out in every way we can, for which we allowed free and unlimited access to all of our content. With all the teachers in attendance, I'll take this opportunity to quickly show you for two minutes how you can get that free access. You visit www.notebook.school. Click on this button, login on the top right. Once you click on that, you would be asked to enter a username and a password. Username is study at home. Password is one, two, three, four, and it's that simple. Click on login and you enter the site. Once you enter the site under my subject, you would find the board CBSC classes one to 12. Uh, for an example, let's say we'll go to class eight English. Under English, you would find the various subtopics. Grammar, writing section, prose, poetry, even internal assignment topics given. Every topic you could browse across the topic you want, click on that topic and the topic would play. We provide very short, crisp videos that take up less than 25% of a classroom time and can be used to stimulate a very engaging discussion around the topic. Hello students. Now why I said this was very pertinent with what ma'am said is that when we were doing note, when we were starting out with notebook, we realized that we do not want to have a me too product. What was the need for another digital learning platform to exist? And we realized that most of the other learning platforms rely very heavily on animation. Animation is eye catching for sure. Unfortunate reality is it often distracts the students and students become a passive observant rather than an active participant in the learning process. Instead, what we did is we created a system called augmented storytelling, where a human instructor comes on screen narrates the story of that particular topic, be it maths or science or English. And then that storytelling is augmented with hand-drawn illustrations, high quality music and some amount of graphics that make the student imagine the two, the, the, the stages between the two steps that they can see on a video. This makes the student a far more active learner in the whole process. I'm sure the schools which are present here today will find the free login useful and can share this with their students and other teachers for a seamless online learning experience. With that, we shall go back to our topic for the day. And it is now time for me to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker comes from 12 times away. It is my pleasure to introduce to Robert Whitehouse. Robert is a teacher and counselor at the Desert Mountain High School in Scottsdale, Arizona in the US. He has 18 years of teaching experience in multicultural classroom. Robert is also a sports and nature enthusiast. Robert, if you're online, could we please have you? Hi, thank you for having me. My name is Robert. Um, having a multicultural classroom uh, when I was young, would have been a good thing. Um, you wouldn't have been... Uh, you, Robert. Would you want to switch on your video? Uh, doesn't look like I can do that. No worries. Just keep this on. Thank you. Please carry on. Um, when I was growing up, um, there was really no multicultural classrooms. There was this group and that group. Um, if we pretty much had that stuff back, I don't think we'd have most of the things that we have today um, with racism, racism, um, people not understanding, um, just like the racism we're having going on um, now. Um, 
with all the riots and protesting, I don't believe we would have all that stuff. I believe our children can understand each other, um, you know, work together. I would have loved to learn uh, different languages um, and st stuff like that just to get to know everybody more, get to understand everybody, get to learn everybody's culture. Uh, but it would just been a good thing to have uh, with the racism that's going on in the world I mean everybody sees everybody for who they're not they prejudge to where you see a gentleman walking down the street of a different color you know first thing a lot of people do is they walk to the other side so they don't have to walk by him they don't have to say hi they don't have to do anything they don't they don't understand them. Um, you have just people anywhere you go, as soon as you see the person, you already made prejudgment. Um, in the world that we have now, we can't do that because everybody's got their own quality. Everybody got their own um, bad quality. But if you get to know the person for who they are, um, you you can understand and become friends and um, I'm a good friend with anybody I can talk to just so I can learn more about their culture, learn more um, about their wording, um, their language, their background, anything like that. Um, it would be, it would have been a lot better for these days than for the, then to deal with all the racism that's going on. Um, I just keep on going back to racism. I mean, that's a big part of the, of human life where, like I said, everybody just judges everybody and they don't even take the time. Um, you got, like I said, the racism that's going on here. Everybody's looting. Everybody's, they're not doing the protest. They're, more or less just vandalizing taking people's businesses down and that's not what our culture stands for our culture is, you know we got freedom um, pretty much anything we want but everybody takes advantage of the situation uh, and i i'm not i don't understand the world that we live in anymore um, you know, I kind of just want to be left alone. I hide in a little corner, per se, um, just to stay away from all the drama that comes along with um, the racism and people not getting along. So, I mean, I'm not one to get into arguments over anything like racism or culture. Or, you know, I just want to understand. If we understand each other, we can make this world a better place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. I know we woke you up at an ungodly hour at uh, Arizona. And thank you so much for making time for this. You're welcome. Uh, if you could just uh, stick around for a little bit. We would want to take a few questions. And if any are addressed to you, if you're okay with that. Yes, I am. Great. So ladies and gentlemen, with that, we come to the question answer sessions. Uh, we have seen some people type in their questions during the session and uh, some of them have already been answered by the experts we have had. Uh, just a couple of questions that came to us during the registration and uh, we will just quickly try and address those. The first one I would address to Ochin. Ochin, we have a question regarding how is content created for online education, keeping in mind multicultural audiences? Would you want to take this one? Sure. So I think uh, very, first of all, that's a very pertinent question. And uh, see, when it comes to creating online content, as you rightly mentioned that uh, we cater to a very wide range of uh, students 
for instance today morning i was just uh, going through our dashboard and what i saw that uh, during uh, last 3 months we have catered to students from more than 23 nationalities 23 countries now quite surprising considering the fact that our content is uh, mainly uh, customized for indian boards cbsc icc and few state boards but as you know you know education education has a language and culture of its own and concepts are common across the world so i'm sure students are finding value in it again within india so uh, we have students from more than uh, 300 districts so that shows that uh, the the kind of uh, wide variety of students who subscribe to notebook and who use use notebook as their preferred choice now that also the huge sense of that also brings a huge sense of responsibility in us now when it comes to creating online content which can cater to which cater to groups from you know various various groups we always ensure that we keep in mind that when we are building our content for example whether it be in terms of sensibilities in terms of the kind of illustrations we use the kind of examples we give uh when it comes to when it comes to uh when it comes to the kind of background music we use we are very careful about two three aspects one is we want to ensure that we are able to connect students students from different states from different backgrounds they should be able to connect with us that's one thing that we always keep in mind so naturally when it comes to giving examples we'll always prefer examples which a little broader in nature which we can connect to larger number of students so that's something that we always keep in mind second we also is sensitive to the fact that uh, you know education has to be inclusive in itself so naturally we want students to feel empowered you know we want students to feel happy so why only students from different regions even even when it comes to variety of students every student has a unique individual learning curve or learning need so we always keep all these factors in mind say for example difference in terms of speed there are students who pick up things very fast but there are others who who take little time and that's completely fine so every, everybody everybody has their own way of learning own style of learning so the objective of the portal the objective of the platform is to ensure that one and all benefit from it so these are things we always keep in mind also another very important aspect is that we very 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 carefully go through the kind of feedback that we get from different regions and when we get this feedbacks we not only categorize them based on age groups we also categorize them based on you know different different regions where we are getting feedback from and we always ensure that feedback that we are getting so so they 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 are always constructively used to build content so i think uh, uh, shubhayu that uh, answers your question thank you achin thank you for the answer uh ms monisha datta if i may come to you for the next question uh you have answered yes. this question in part over chat the question mm-hmm. asks we talk about accepting others how can we teach them self acceptance would you want to take this one uh so uh, when we talk about self acceptance the basic thing is that we need to teach the child that all of us are different right we may be good at something but not good at the other thing so if we are going to be always targeting the things that we are not good at it is difficult for us to encourage our own selves see in today's uh, day and time we all need to be able to motivate our own selves uh, there's one point that i've been awfully thinking about when uh, children are normally young the thing that we are teaching the children is that you should be able to um, you know you share things you give your thing to the other because you want the other person to be uh, you have to show sharing and because of covid-19 now our philosophy is going to be do not share anything do not give your things to anyone so with a young child when you are teaching that child something like that and then later on to change that and i don't know how we're going to be able to do that that's a thought that's been on so when we talk about self love or self acceptance the the time and again the reinforcement of the fact that all of us are different sharing our own failures and letting them know that we might not be able to do a lot of things see what happens is uh, children normally see adults as uh, people who do not fail 
And we also try to portray in front of them that we've had nothing but success stories. So we need to share our failures, our times of doubt, when we are not feeling all that great about how we look or um, how we feel. If we start doing that transparent conversation with the people around, they will understand that we all are different and we all have our own uh, doubts at times, but those doubts do not need to stay on as a pertinent, uh, uh, an important fact in our life. So self-acceptance can only be taught by continuously giving reinforcement of the fact that it's okay to not feel okay. And at the same point of time, um, encouraging the child in whatever needs to be done. Now, provided this question was for when we are dealing uh, with a child, because most of the time, that's a trait we need to build from a very young age. We need to teach the child not to compare, but to be able to accept themselves as they are, whether it is to do with their physical abilities or to do with their other abilities. Thank you so much for that answer, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, if I may trouble Mr. Manon for a minute, we have a question, how to handle the individual differences during online classes? Mr. Manon, if you're there. Yeah, I, I can. Uh, yes. Can you just repeat the question? So the question asks how to handle the individual differences during online classes. Uh, of course, uh, as I told you that uh, during online classes, uh, the things which uh, a teacher is missing, obviously, is the emotional touch. Once you are just having the online classes, the face reading which a teacher does over there is not possible. And whether a child have understood that particular concept or got defocused there in between can't be interpreted. So under that circumstances, you know, uh, the teacher, uh, that's why it, I, I shared with you that we should be able to reach to the student the best possible way through different videos, through different animations and other things over there so that uh, we, we can, you know, deliver them in a very fair manner. Uh, of course, the individual difference will remain and uh, will remain always there. And the counter check which comes over there through, uh, you know, now on online, we are carrying out the MCQs, uh, multiple choice questions. Uh, fortunately, uh, for the past two years, um, CBSE also have started the 20% of the evaluation with the MCQ. Uh, and certainly we, we are just making our parents also a partner over there as an invigilator whenever we are conducting uh, online test for them for a duration of one hour like that. So, uh, as you said that the individual differences obviously is a challenge as of now. However, we have told all our students on Zoom to let the cameras being switched on. Our teachers are trying their level best to read their faces and their activities going on the table there. So, uh, this is what means I would like to comment upon them. Thank you so much, sir. Robert, I have an interesting one for you. Uh, we have a question which asks, what are the language challenges in a multicultural class? Now, you teach a class where I'm sure you have students of different nationalities. How do you overcome the language barrier if you're teaching young kids? Um, deal with the language barrier. There's, it's kind of difficult at times, uh, mostly because you... Uh, they're saying one thing and meaning another. Um, and I have the same situation to where I say things and I mean something else and people get upset. So trying to understand the children and what they're saying, um, even the, trying to understand the parents. Um, and it isn't what they're actually the, they're saying, it's what they're actually meaning. Um, it just it makes it difficult sometimes, um, but you just learn to understand. You learn to you think about what they're saying, and usually everything works out okay. Thank you. That's great. Thanks a lot. I think that's all the time we have for question and answers today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have been doing multiple editions of this Together for Education webinar. We have uh, two sessions uh, in the coming week, one on Wednesday, the other on Saturday. And we look forward to having you there. My name is Shubhayu Roy. I'm the co-founder of Notebook and it's been a pleasure hosting this session. It is now my job to invite Ochin back for the vote of thanks. Ochin, if you may. Sure.
So I think we had a great, uh, great session. And I'm sure uh, all of us uh, really, really enjoyed the deliberations. But it's a very thoughtful. And you rightfully set the tone for the evening. Mr. Manon, thanks for sharing your experience and real life challenges. You know, these are unique perspectives. And I'm sure everyone in the audience and all of us really, really, really appreciate it. Ms. Manisha Datta, very elegant and honest articulation. Listening to you has been a pleasure. And Mr. Robert Grithouse, thank you so much for joining. And as you said, we all look forward to a more inclusive world for our children. I would also like to thank our audience for their great support. We have been hosting these sessions twice a week, Wednesdays and Saturdays, same time, five o'clock in the evening. And we are really humbled by the great participation and the kind of enthusiasm that we are getting. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you.